Thank you, John. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So I know you're all here to hear in-house presentation about the journey of uh, Mestar. I'm just going to do a brief warm-up for her. So I'll give a very brief introduction about Zenbox and show you some insights of huge amount of data we collected across hundreds of hospitals about what we're seeing today about these medical devices, what are the security issues we are observing. And then most of the time we'll give it to Inhal to talk about uh, her journey at uh, MedStar. So as some of you might know, Zingbox provides security for your medical devices. And we started from Stanford uh, more than four years ago in Silicon Valley. And now we have the largest deployment in uh, healthcare. And of course we won many awards. So just a brief review of what Rafa and I presented at last MD Expo about what are the medical devices we have been seeing and uh, how the first top three categories mount up to 82% of the total medical devices we're seeing, including infusion pumps, imaging systems, and uh, uh, patient monitor. And the type of security issues we're seeing, or the, the, even though we have the most number of infusion pumps, but actually the type of medical devices gives us the most security issues are imaging system. And right next to it is the patient monitor. So all the top three categories mount up to 86% of all the security issues. And what are these security issues? There are two major categories. The very first one we see are user practice issues. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why we're seeing 41% security issues come from user practice. And then there are road applications, there are browser usage issues. And then the second largest category is outdated operating system and software. And we'll dive deeper into these categories. And there are also collateral movement because we're connected to IT network, their default login name and uh, user password, et cetera. And today we're going to go deeper to look into, because we see many imaging systems are the most vulnerable systems, and we see these two big categories are causing these security issues. So let's take a deep dive into imaging systems. First, let's look at the out, outdated operating systems. So what we're seeing, among these imaging systems. So only 15% are actively supported today. And uh, about 27% are obsoleted uh, operating systems. And by next year, we're going to see another 58% operating systems are not going to be supported. So if we're not doing anything now, by next year, we're going to see 85% of imaging systems, the operating systems they're using, are not going to be supported. And we see across the board, about 82% of operating systems use our imaging systems, our window systems. That actually gives you some idea about uh, the support and the vulnerability. And also what kind of behaviors we're seeing at these. So we talked about the biggest security issue come from user behaviors. What kind of behaviors we're seeing at these systems? Any guesses what kind of behaviors we've seen that not, are not supposed to be there? Email? Yes, that's a very good one. So we see a whole bunch of behaviors that are not supposed to be there, but they are there. For example, we see 54% of these imaging systems are actually connected to international locations. And we see 27 of them go to social network sites. And we see 24% of them are doing shopping. And 20% are running personal emails. And 11% are visiting risky sites. And that includes match.com. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, there's like games and uh, all kinds of uh, adult content, and all kinds of 
behaviors that are definitely not supposed to be there. And just want to give you a brief overview of what kind of attacks we're seeing nowadays to these medical devices. <clears throat> the biggest one we are seeing about a quarter of the attacks we're seeing are called exploit kit. Basically, we know people know their vulnerabilities on some devices, whether a port is open or there are CVEs or there's buffer uh, overflow issue, and there are people, particularly developed software, it can be open source or it can be paid tools, to use these software to exploit these devices. And whenever they do find vulnerabilities, they can go through these devices. And the second category of malware, including Trojan uh, 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 worms, uh, spyware, so we do see lots of, because of these malwares, we do see lots of lateral movements coming from IT world to the IoT, to the medical device world. And of course, phishing and default passwords, ransomware, etc. So, a common practice in today's hospital, how do we protect these medical devices? A very common practice is to create VLANs. Basically, I put certain amount of devices into a separate virtual network to isolate them so that I can control what it can access, what can goes into it. So these VLANs are supposed to protect these medical devices. And the best design of these VLANs will be say, okay, I put all my infusion pods into onto one VLAN, separated from all other devices so that I can have better control. But what we're seeing today is actually only 3% of these VLANs have medical devices only. That's the ideal case we want to have. But, and there are another 25% have non-medical connected devices. We call them non-medical IoT devices. But the majority of them have a mix of medical devices, non-medical devices, IT devices. That's the worst thing we want to see. And we see there are lots of room we can improve to better protect these medical So let's take a look at what's the distribution of VLANs today. Let's take pick any hospital. We try to figure out how many VLANs a particular hospital has. The, so this is the distribution. This is the number of medical VLANs. Medical VLANs means VLANs have medical devices on them. And number of VLANs at each hospital among all different hospitals we've been seeing. And what's the distribution? And this is this year's data. And the ideal case is we don't want a too few number of VLANs because that means your network is too flat. We don't want too many number of VLANs because that means your network is way too complicated. It's very hard to manage and too big. So the ideal case we hope to have, look, see something like this. Have about a dozens of VLANs, not too few, not too many. And this is this year's data. It's uh, still room to improve, but compared to last year's data, we already see some improvement. Because from last year, we see about 88 of blue bars. We saw 88% of the uh, hospitals have less than 20 VLANs. That means two few VLANs. And this year, it goes down to 56%. And to the, to the middle size VLANs, from 20 to 50, Last year, it was only 10%, and this year, it increased to 36%. So we are seeing a good trend. The hospitals are doing a good job to make improvements. So this is a data, the same distribution data we saw before. We see the most number of devices are infusion pumps. And we want to see how many VLANs each type of devices occupies. For example, the infusion pot, even though it has 46% of total number of devices, but it only occupies 8% of VLANs, which is good because we want infusion pots to be concentrated into a small number of VLANs for us to uh, manage them. But if we look at imaging systems, even though it only has 19% number of devices, but it occupies more than half of the VLANs, that most means every other VLAN you see, there's a medical imaging system there. 
We understand there are challenges here because these devices are spread out uh, in your network in different locations of the hospital. So there are technical challenges, but we still think there are ways we can improve the number, reduce the number of relapses these devices occupy. So this is just an example, we call that heat map. It's basically an example from one particular hospital. We already anonymized the IP addresses. We want to see the distribution of different types of devices across different VLECs. So the X axis are different VLECs, Y axis are infusion pumps, medical imaging systems, etc. And we see an ideal case, this is actually a very good hospital. They did a great job managing their network. So we do see the good cases are there are quite a few hundred percent. That means all infusion pumps are aggregated into one VLEC. And we see some um, a Diacom server are also 100% at one VLAN. But we also see some devices like uh, point of care analyzer tracking system, a uh, docking system, are actually across so many VLANs. So there are many cases we can still make a better fit and make improvement. So I know we mainly care about medical devices and how we secure them. But because today's, in today's hospital, medical devices are connected with non-medical devices and are connected to IT devices. So I just want to give you a very brief view about what kind of non-medical IoT devices we're seeing in today's hospitals. And uh, people like Intel, she actually has to manage both medical and non-medical IoT devices. So what are the guesses? What kind of, uh, what are the number one non-medical IoT devices we're seeing? Alexa, that's a good one. We are definitely seeing increasing amount of Alexa out there in the hospital. So this is a kind of distribution like what we did for medical devices. So number one, it also has very similar distribution. The one type of device, a device is occupied, uh, takes about half of the total number of devices. So IP phone is what we're seeing the most. And number one uh, are printers. And so the top two category amounts to about 60% of top three category amounts to about 70% of total prices for non-medical IoT prices. So any guess about which one of these is most vulnerable, is most causing most security issues? Print. Print. Yeah, uh, he was suggesting printer which is an uh, excellent answer because we do see printer is way out here. Even though camera number cameras, very small number, but the camera is the number one security challenge. And number two are the printers we're seeing. So that's a very brief overview. We're going to come out with this year's uh, thread report with all the details uh, very soon. And you're welcome. If you're interested, welcome to leave uh, your email address. We can send it to you once the full detailed report comes out. And now I'll pass the stage to Intel for first to give you a detailed journey about uh, this. Thank you. Thank you, May. So May has given you all this good information about what's going on. And in our environment, and I'm going to give you information about what we have done at Mesta. But first, I would like to start with you know demystifying some of the myths myths out there about medical devices. So I have to put that one out there. <laughs> I don't have any conflict of interest, um, so I'll just close for this. So um, make sure. I don't so I, as you know, I'm from Mesta. We are the largest healthcare provider in Washington. Maryland area. We have about 10 hospitals, 278 clinics, so I do have a very complex environment to deal with. And this is my environment. So traditionally, IT security, we only cared about PCs, we only cared about servers, uh, but the environment is complex and my position has been created under IT security. And as you all know, I come from clinical engineering background. And I'm responsible of all medical IoT, medical device security, any other IoT that you mentioned, cameras, um, printers, um, as well as building automation systems. 
So at Meta, we have, after deploying uh, um so we have about, we can tell like we have 20% of our total endpoints that are medical IoT. Uh, among our, um, we have deployed Zingvas in four, four of our hospitals, we were able to, to discover 77 um, um, IoTs out there including medical IOTs and non-medical IOTs. But in total, in our inventory, in clinical engineering, we have about 77,000 medical devices, and our connected devices are a medical devices managed by clinical engineer, about 17,000. So as you can see, the uh, it's a big scope. And right now, all the med about 40% of the devices uh, that medical device that we purchase are connected. So this number is, this problem is not going away, it's actually becoming bigger. Uh, so first of all, I mean, we've heard, I mean, the first, first we heard about medical devices and medical device security issue, we heard about the fusion pumps, right? Uh, we heard about, Hasbera has made the news about the, the, the vulnerability that they have on there. Uh, Medtronic has made the news with the defibrillator cardiac. It's it, all you hear when you hear about medical device security. You hear about infusion pumps. The examples are infusion pumps, are uh, pacemakers, uh, care programmers, or our CT scanners, MRI. Um, but that is not what medical device security is about. So now we we, we know. Medical device security issues is what was discovered, was was showcased by May. It's what we care about because, I mean, honestly, there are easier ways to kill you than to act as a pacemaker. Someone has to be close to you. They have to, you know, kind of. So it's it's not it's not a real threat unless you are like someone really famous. Maybe that's a real threat. But even though, like, there are easier ways to to kill you. Um, so, <laughs> so what we care about uh, in security is um, these issues, uh, outdated OS devices that uh, that are obsolete. And if a device is also new and has supported the OS, but it's sitting in our environment, not receiving patches, it's also considered obsolete. And then the devices that can reach the internet, because then hackers can they are actually, they, if they're not updated, the security updated, they have CPEs, then they can be exploited. And also misconfigured devices, ports, devices that have ports open, that are staying open, devices that are not properly isolated. So we talked about the VLANs, but we discovered that we have devices that are sitting on our domain, they're not isolated, that they have not been receiving patches on a regular schedule, they don't have AV on them. So that is where we really worry about the security. So now we know what's the issue about medical device security. Next time you have someone saying, oh yeah, we saw that uh, vulnerability about the uh, Medtronic, uh, uh, it was the uh, programmer, uh, you're like, yeah, okay, but that's really low, even though uh, they, the score, the TPS is high, but in order for someone to exploit it, it has to be enabled, someone needs to be in the same room with the patient, that is not what medical device security in a healthcare environment is. So also I want to talk about what the emergent technology and emergent threats that healthcare environment is facing. Okay, so my microphone has not been working on Okay, so we've seen an expansion in cloud computing and raise your hand if you bought a piece of device or software imaging that has a piece of cloud computing or a cloud computing system in the last year. Yeah, so that's where it's going. So we're buying these software example. You can buy an imaging processing software that's used to, to, to diagnose certain diseases. So the software is installed on your computer, but then they say some of the systems, like the usage data, is actually sent to the cloud to give you authorization to use the software, or the images are sent to the cloud um, for uh, processing and you get the report back. Uh, the uh, imaging archiving system are all going to the cloud. Um, but that brings a whole set of security. Hey, May, is your is your transmitter on? Maybe maybe if you turn yours off, that might help out with the feedback. Yeah. Okay. So that brings a whole sense of security. We don't have visibility about what's going on in cloud. The cloud is somewhere, right? It's in the sky. <laughs> Some organizations do have their own private cloud, so that is a more controlled environment. 
but our data is on Amazon. So our not only our shopping behavior, but also now it's our patient data. It's also our uh, sensitive data, not just PHI, but also our financial data, maybe other information. Um, so we, the way we address this in Nestar, we have created a cloud addendum that is used when we buy these solutions. Now also we have seen, this is a tablet that is now an ultrasound, so we caught this one. So we found it in a the hospital, they bought it, they're gonna use it to diagnose patients. And um, it's a tablet, so you buy your own tablet, so it's an example of bringing your own device, so the manufacturer does not provide you with a tablet. It's a tablet that has this, um, you can install this application on, use the probe, and you can also use it with your phone. Uh, so with this type of device, we want to make sure that we put a mobile device management on it, that we have policies in place that if it's lost, we can erase it remotely, so we don't have any data that is lost in there. And then the other trend we see is also uh, patient-generated health data. This is where you have uh, your patient, you go to an office, and then you enter your EMR data, and you, you enter your, um, your information about the, the visit, and then you send it to your EMR. And that brings a whole set of security, but that's where the industry is going. Um, one of the examples is like we care about the integrity of the data during the transmission. We, tear, we, tear, we care about the confidentiality, the way we address it. We have make sure that we have a computerized app that clears the cache up in the exit. So if you lose your phone and you're still logged on, they won't be able to access any of the data. Want to make sure that the integrity is uh, that there is hashing during the transition. But all of this, if you collaborate with your IT security department, then make sure that this has been taken care of. Um, but as we can see, so the threats also are um, raise your hands if you've seen this article. I've received it so many people in my entire in my hospital. The the malware that was injected into the CT scanner that modified the images. Okay. So I just want to show a, a video about, this is an example of emergent threat that healthcare organizations are going to be um, facing, and this customized malware that can modify the integrity of your devices. Because in, in the traditional IT security is driven by confidentiality, uh, but with medical device security, what we most care about is the integrity, making sure that our devices uh, function as intended. So let's see if the video works. Videos never work when you go in a presentation. <laughs> I think I'm going to just skip it. Uh, but mainly, it's a Raspberry Pi that someone went into um, the cat lab and um, they, they plugged into the network jack and then they were able to get into the CT scanner and then they have patients with cancer and they were able to modify the images. Uh, but, so two things, if you have like a, 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 bit like a system like Zingbox, you will be able to detect that someone is getting into your network and trying to modify your device, but it's also, um, this is more like a targeted attack, which is not really what healthcare is. If someone has to be uh, intentionally going into your environment and trying to do this for your patient, which is, you know, can happen, but that's not what medical device security is about, because all these obsolete devices, all these internet that are not protected, that not properly segregated. And then the other threat is also we have the, the uh, remote desktop support. We have so much, uh, customize access from medical device manufacturers. Uh, we give them access to, for support from as a clinical engineering department. We use my go to my WebEx. We don't always do, or we use uh, RDP, which is exposes your network. And then that's the next uh, uh, generation of attacks that they will be exploiting that in order to get into your network. And then the way to protect that is to make sure you have, you use your privileged access management system that your IT security uses. Make sure your vendors, you will uh, tell your vendors to use that. 
So we talked about you know, all these issues. Now we understand right, what are the issues in medical device security. We know it's not infusion pumps. We know it's not uh, cardiac programs. But we know what is the real issue that we need to address. So at MedStar, uh, we built a medical device security program. I started the program with an IT security. I have an analyst right now. And um, I'm going to have more in the future. But we really want to make sure that our clinical area uh, are resilient to cyber threats, uh, that we're able to continuously see our patient without delay in care and treatment. And if you're actually trying to raise visibility around your medical device security issue, I have a solution for you. Collaborate with internal audit. Uh, internal audit, either like a, your own internal audit or external audit, but have them audit your medical device security program, you're going to have engagement and visibility. Uh, you're going to have leadership buy-in. Um, for us, so we start, We had uh, a, an audit that started before I joined my position, and then that allowed me to have uh, buy-in and ownership from all these different departments. So I oversee uh, not just uh, clinical engineer, but as well like devices that are managed by lab and pharmacy. Um, so they were all engaged in the audit, and uh, we collect with supply chain as well, and we collaborated to close this audit item. And with that, we were able, we needed to create processes and workflows around it. Uh, and that, that helps us create the cultures. I think, uh, so traditionally, like your IT security don't really go into the hospitals, but given my experience uh, and work in a clinical engineering, I always go to hospitals and make sure I, I speak with all our customers and also the clinicians whenever I have the opportunity. And we're able to get executive leadership support. This is crucial for any, you know, because security is there to add work, like it's additional work that we're asking people to do. Uh, so if we don't have leadership and we don't have appropriate metrics to report back to senior leadership, uh, it's not going to happen. And then the vision eventually is to incorporate security into the entire life cycle of the uh, health technology, and by that I mean medical devices, medical IUTs, and IUTs. Um, but the focus would be today for medical devices. <clears throat> so, what are my key performance indicators? Uh, how I judge that uh, you know I'm producing results for me because I'm with IT security, so I do all the contracts. So I'm generated by number of contracts that we added security addendum to. A uh, number of security review that we do at the uh, model level of health technology. Unique model connected to the network is working with each of these departments and make sure that they have identified their devices connected to the network. And they have related that with the data that we have discovered from Zinkbox. And as well, critical and high finding mitigated. But as far as clinical engineering goes, if you want to create metrics for how to measure your medical device security program, one of the metrics, key performance indicators you can have is number of the unique models manufacturers connected to the, to, the, to the network. This data needs to be clean in TMS. We cannot have CMS, CMS, ENC. You know, it has to be clear, and that's the basics for your program. And then let's say also the uh, number of devices that you know what OS not runs on, software version, and also um, number of devices that you have patched according to schedule within last year. Uh, that's a good indicator of your where your program is. So as I know, so my role is explained a little bit. I'm just going to not go through much detail so we can get to the nitty-gritty of the presentation. But basically, um, at IT security, we do the security review on these devices. We do the risk assessment. We come up with these controls that need to be applied to the device, and we hand back off to clinical engineering to apply it. Uh, we identify. Uh, we work with them and identify if there is any security vulnerability, we make sure we communicate that to the department along with the action that they need to take. Uh, we also, I also work with legal a lot uh, in the security language and negotiating that with the vendor and legal to put that into the contract. And really, my role is to report on our uh, medical device security posture to leadership. And then clinical engineering, you guys are the in the grounds, you have your devices, you have access to your devices, so you have the, the control over how much, you know, we actually operationalize medical devices. 
security. Um, whether uh, did we apply, did we make sure that the AV is up to date? Did we apply these controls? Did we see a device that has a malware? Have we engaged IT security? Um, did you participate in tabletop exercise? We do that a lot at MedStar. So it's really important for medical device. If you're interested in building a robust medical device security program, I think the most important thing to do is to collaborate. Um, so if here at, Med, at MD Expo, I'm going to give you my email address. By the exchange information, there is an NHSI group called MDSIC. I recommend if you're interested to join it. That's how you can get information about security vulnerabilities and all this information that is out there. There is a lot of um, conferences as well that you can attend. Uh, but make sure you put collaboration with medical device manufacturers, security professionals um, out there. Uh, you get a lot of information. And from medical device, I think, you know, we say when we talk about medical device security issue, we often like send the blame to the medical device manufacturers. Uh, but imagine a case, so if you have this technical questionnaire, each, each hospital have their own version. So if I'm, if I'm a vendor, I'm receiving all these versions of, of questionnaires. And it's, it, the way we apply security at MedStar is different from the way we apply security at other hospitals. So these manufacturers would have to work or would have to test their devices for each case. And then that, you know, the, 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 uh, the life cycle, the regulator takes more time because they have to test for every single scenario. We might use automatic patching, but you might say, no, we're not okay with it. We, we want to make sure we just patch it manually. And that just adds on. We want to use our own AV, but another hospital will say, no, we just use whatever the manufacturer comes up with. So they will have to test the goals against all these scenarios. And I think if we want to address medical device security issue, we at a healthcare organization, we should come up with a consensus into how we apply security to our medical devices. And we also do medical device security uh, incident response preparedness exercise, tabletop exercise. I think it's a good exercise. We've done it uh, with, uh, we're, we're doing some with also with the operation IT security, IT operation. Um, like your power head desk and also clinical engineering. And this really helps you prepare for if there is an incident and see how prepared you are. But one of the documentation you can um, get on the subject is um, this one that was recently released by MITRE. And in it, um, it says like when in your inventory, you should indicate whether the device is supported by you, whether it's supported by 100% by a vendor or whether it's outsourced with a third party provider, that is an crucial information in an incident because if you're not supporting the device, you won't have access to do anything to it. And the best thing you do when you have a device that is infected with malware is just to take it off the network or try to shut it down. That won't work. And uh, so I want to go into, we hear about like uh, building security into the medical device life cycle and I want to show you what we have done and where we are and what our, um, what, what our, what we're doing next. So, um, so we incorporated security into the procurement process. So right now we're getting all the MDS2, we're doing a security review on that. We make sure we indicate who's managing the OS. Uh, so if there is a security addendum contract, we need to make sure that, you know, we add the security language to it. Uh, we also build an addendum that is handled all the devices that are on time and material. Um, raise your hand if you try to do a BAA on a device that is time and material. But we've been able to uh, work that out uh, at MedStar. And then uh, we created an uh, inventory standard. So for these departments, clinical engineering, lab, pharmacy, what is the information that they need to keep on these devices to make sure that we manage security on these devices properly? And that is, among them, IP, MAC address, knowing whether it's static IP, whether it's wireless, whether it's LAN. Um, that's information that these, de these departments haven't had, you know, they're not technical most of the time. But they were able to, I think with, with the audit, they were able like to work on it and um, really get a handle on it. Um, and then the device maintenance um, parameters that I just mentioned, the patching strategies, um, I think that's room for improvement, an area for improvement. And then uh, whatever security controls that are issued by uh, 
IT security, uh, meaning our department, uh, that they are stored with the device. Right now, we have it in a separate system and they have access to it, but I think it would be good to have it stored with the device. So next time you go in there and you can see, okay, uh, what are the requirements that IT security has issued? And then eventually we want to go into uh, building, really applying during the life cycle of the device, uh, checking for these controls, checking whether the ADB is still there, encryption is still there, whether the AV is up to date, whether the one, when was the last time, and then document that into the preventive maintenance procedure. This is something you can do as an HTM. And then the other thing is during, you need to make sure you are subscribing to these notifications for security vulnerabilities. So we get that through ICS cert and DSIC, but a lot of medical device manufacturers do have a way of going into their portal and you register. So whenever there is a new uncontrolled risk or security vulnerability, that meaning the security vulnerability that has a significant risk on patient, um, impact on patient, that you can go in there and register for it. And then we, we do a lot of scanning of medical device security. Raise your hand if you're afraid of medical device scanning. You shouldn't be. <laughs> because there is a uh, like surface scan that you can do and there is what is called the credential scans. Uh, in order to get credential scans, all of the new devices that are coming right now, we've seen more secure devices. We've seen medical device manufacturers say, contact us, we will turn all the options necessary for you to do credential scans. And if you can do that, that's great. If not, you can do one of the T-scan, like just surface scan. And um, you can do that with Zingbox today as well. Like they have their uh, own surface scan that you can do. We also do scans when we have a device that abnormally, it's not doing what's supposed to, and just validate that, confirm that it's actually an abnormal behavior. So uh, now I'm going to go into our Zinc box. Which time do we do? Okay. So after we, you've done all of this, and um, so having a tool that allows you to have visibility over what you have on your network, I think is really valuable. And uh, I think you, there is a lot of, the, uh, lot of, uh, many, competitors out there, uh, but you need to set up your selection criteria and, um, you know, how established is the company and what are their customers is one of the biggest uh, selection criteria should we look at that because that's how, like, how long is the company going to stay in the market and then what systems they can integrate with and whether you can leverage these integrations. They might have all these great integrations, but if you don't have those systems, you won't be able to implement it. So one of the things, important things is network access control. So you can quarantine the device uh, firewall, so you can block certain sites. And um, whether you have a security information event, uh, event management, um, this is important when you investigate resource the incident, it makes it easier. Um, and then, so integration with, do you want to have integration with IS and clinical engineering asset management? And whether you want to be doing, do you have your own vulnerability, vulnerability scanning tool, or do you want to have a scanning tool uh, that is provided to you by them? So in the deployment phase, um, so um, we have, uh, you need to make sure that you have the needed collaboration in place from the beginning. Um, it's uh, it's kind of, so you have to have it, whether it's this IT, IT security that's going to sponsor this tool, or is it clinical engineering? Um, but if it's clinical engineering, you need to make sure you establish the proper workflow. So who's going to be monitoring these alerts, right? You're going to receive these alerts in the evening, at night, during the day. Who's going to monitor these alerts and who's going to tell me whether this is a normal or abnormal behavior? Do I have, an FM, do I have a security specialist within my team? Certain do. But it might not make sense for some hospitals. You might want IT security watching these others for you and telling you, yeah, should I be jumping right now or should I wait a few minutes and I'll address this tomorrow in the morning. That's really important. Um, and just take a risk-based approach. You don't have to have everything in place. And you might want to decide 
I want to just monitor my medical devices, medical IoT right now, and maybe I'll take it, which is what I'm doing, and then I will extend it to other IoTs in the future. Um, and then, like, the workflow. So how do I'm going to track? So I'm going to receive this alerts from Zingbox uh, or other system that I'm using, and how am I going to document that? Uh, where uh, is am I going to create an IT ticket? Is IT security going to create an IT ticket to my system? And then I'm going to have to create work order in my CMS. Because eventually, we do want these uh, security alerts to be tracked with the asset themselves. That's a valuable information for you to have. I have these uh, devices, and they have this many security alerts um, that have been, or I've addressed these vulnerabilities. It, it's all in one place. So even if IT is going to create a ticket in their systems, I think it's important that you track that. And when IT closes, they can also refer your uh, your ticket. And if you want to go back to that and say, why did we decide that this is a normal behavior? Right? Why did we decide that it's okay for our clinicians to browse the internet from a die conversation? And then we can go back into that ticket. And then we also had an integrate. We uh, worked out an integration with our semantic SOC because we want to make sure that if we have uh, an ability in notification in the evening where that someone is watching and if something we need to talk to a jump on a tech bridge for that we are able to do it and if we want to initiate the incident response that we are able to do it. Um, in IT security we have people on call in the evening and then we have people assigned to so um, let's, some of the lessons learned that I will share uh, from you with you is um, plan for any integration you need uh, upfront. So there might be, you know, some professional services that are uh, you will have to be accounting for if you have like a CMS that is not related to service not platform that you want to make sure that you integrate with. You want to make sure that you account for these things. The other big uh, element is be your enterprise architecture, making sure that you account whether that uh, you're going to be using what they call like a tab device. They won't, they won't probably allow you to configure the appliance and do span ports because they say well, that they would say, oh, that's going to impact our my network performance. You're going to have to create that. So this is an additional cost and that you will have to be accounting for. And um, at Medflower, we are able like, to do span port for some of our smaller facilities. And then layer two versus layer three. So in your network, you might have, if you have like a fairly recent hospital, your core would be collapsed. So all you have to do is make sure that you have an appliance, that you put it there, and then you, that you're good to go. But if you have like a, an old hospitals that have like 12 distribution access, with, they for distribution uh, closets and switches, and then you have to get together all that information from there. So you need to build, there might be additional fiber that you need to be accounting for, there might be tab device. In our, my environment, two of our hospitals, they're um, our biggest hospital, but they're also the oldest one. We're going to have to um, validate that we have fiber in place, and then we're going to buy tab device. But eventually, it's good practice to have a tab device in place, because that can be used for other things with IT security. So that is something that you need to account for. And there would be like some work that needs to be done in the beginning. It's once you you made the you you you've gone through the implementation and the closing, deciding which alert you're addressing, then it just becomes, you know, it lower it becomes uh, business as usual and you don't have as much uh, work, but there is a certain amount of work that you need to account for in the beginning when you deploy the solution. And then the other thing, if you have off-site clinics, uh, in where where are you capturing that traffic? In our case, we have about 278 clinics. So I'm not going to be able like, to put 278 clients in each of my sites. So I'm going to have to just decide where I strategically I'm going to keep placing these appliances so I capture most of you know uh, the traffic that I need to capture. Unfortunately, uh, all of the servers that you know talk to uh, or medical device talk to, they are actually in hospitals. So if I put um, and all this, all the traffic goes into two locations. So if I put the appliance there, I'll be able to capture most of what I have uh, done. 
So the other thing when we deployed uh, Zane Glass, we find out that we have um, we have so much more devices than we thought we had, and specifically not just medical devices, which we have a little bit better handle of, but more building automation system, more other IoTs, and um, so I submitted um, a requirement for additional uh, because we we've, we've discovered this, so this helps you build your program. Say I have this many devices that I'm monitoring, and that I need you know one FTE, two FTE, so. Um, that's that's helpful. And then where am I going now? Right, with that. so it's just Cisco Prime. Uh, this integration is already we have we are Cisco Prime, so everybody knows that. So we're going to integrate it with uh, Cisco Prime so that we know. Oftentimes we get an alert about the uh, vulnerability about the, uh, that device has malware and configure, and we still deal with configure. Way old, but we still have it. Uh, but we know it's one of our hospitals, but we know we don't know where. Is it an ICU? Is it a, where is it? So you look for it. You're like, what, what is it? Okay. So when you have this type of integration, you can say, okay, it's connected to this switch and it's like the third floor east building, so I can go there and I can look for it and find it. And, and then the other thing is integration with uh, our SEIM. We're going to get one and that helps you. So. These tools capture all these logs from all these different systems, so it makes um, investigating an alert uh, easier rather than IT security going into all these tools to validate whether the information, what information we have, it helps. So if you have a tool like this, it makes uh, your uh, integration a lot easier. And then the other thing is uh, building the IS security workforce. So we are. Uh, I have one resource and uh, we're going to have one more. And that is um, right now there is no IT security. I mean, a specialist that knows medical devices, knows the clinical environment, knows IT security. It, we're asking this person to do so many things. So you're going to have to compromise. So, what is the most, if you're clinical engineering, you might not go with a clinical engineer. You might want to go with an IT security. <clears throat> That you can teach them the clinical engineering work because they have this all this background that they can bring into your own department. Um, and the other thing, we're deploying a PAM privilege access management solution so we can take care of all these RGP and all the other issues I was talking about. And then the other thing is also restricting internet access. So we're upgrading our firewall, and then we will be able to uh, restrict medical device access to only the required website. Uh, because that, as we talked about in the beginning, that is also one of the issues, main issues in medical device security. And then the other thing is working with these departments to get visibility on our uh, patching status and ownership. Um, so how are these devices patched? Are we, do we, are we updating them according to schedule? Because that's an important piece. Like we can do all this work, security review, and we can apply these controls, but we need to have that implemented. Um, and then the, rest thing, the last is deploying a security program for uh, the Internet of Things and uh, industrial control systems. So that is something that I will be working on in the, for the next year. Any questions? So you have uh, ThingBox integrated with Prime. Uh, not yet. Oh, not yet. Uh, so Prime is great. <laughs> Is there a plan to move forward with maybe Cisco ICE as well and have Prime and ICE working together so that you have a control yeah. function? So uh, Cisco ICE for us is, uh, we have wireless Cisco ICE. Um, we have an old network, so we we're working on that. So once we have Cisco ICE wired, then we will leverage that. But you might already have that in your environment in that case, that's great. Yes? So, what we found is your similar point where you are, the most useful integration is on you, or to integrate on my back. Yeah. We use surf now, whatever you need for your IT and surf management. The vulnerability scanner in our CMS, we are there either done or also done, integrating those. That is automated, given number of processes, built in our databases. 
we have uh, increased security without attachment to the community left work. We probably are the most busted, still have to have many interests in that address in the year of the event. So it's all key up there. I'm going to go. Yeah. No, I mean, it all starts with, you know, knowing what you have, right? But uh, knowing what devices you have. But the MAC address is also in Zinkbox. So if you don't have the, that, that, so to correlate, which the asset exactly we're talking about, you know, you have the manufacturers, you have that, you have the model, but to exactly know what is, it's, it's have to have a coloration, coloration, but coloration, you, you know I, what I mean. I, uh, but I think you can still have this tool. You don't need all this you know, integration, it definitely improves the workflow. But even if you don't have a CMS that is actually integrated, you can still leverage this tool. I think it's important to know that. I, I think the greatest takeaway from your presentation this morning is the opportunity for the folks that are attending this session to get engaged. If you're not engaged with medical device security at your facility and you're not connected with your CISO, uh, you need to do that. The value proposition that you can add to your facility. You made a, a statement that was great. I wrote it down because you talked about your security folks. They don't go into the hospital. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of IT, and I don't know how your IT departments operate, but my IT, they they don't uh, they don't have an affinity for medical devices. Uh, that's us. That that's who we are. We live, eat, and breathe the medical device. My IT department has access to my CMS product. That's where they get the MAC address. It's, they know the IP address of the device, but now they go into our system and they can see the full detail. Okay, it's uh, an MRI, it's, it's got this MAC address and all the appropriate data. And that's why it's so important for your CMS to have uh, the accuracy and the detail associated with it. Give them access to your CMS. Uh, that's the value that you bring to the the party. So, you know, everybody wants more pay and more visibility and this is what's going to do it for you. If you if you want to bitch and moan about your IT department, you're going to be a dinosaur because they're going to find somebody that's going to help them and uh, and uh, do away with this vulnerability that's hanging out there. It's not about killing patients. These, these, these organizations, these various organizations that come into your facility they're not trying to kill your patients. They're trying to steal your data, whether it's uh, uh, even uh, corporate espionage. They're trying to steal your data and sell your data, uh, ransomware, they're trying to extract money. It's all about the money. And uh, the opportunity that you have to help your facility mitigate those risks is fantastic. Yeah. That's a good takeaway. <laughs> now, I think this problem, as I explained, is not going away, actually. It's, get, it's becoming bigger. So we might as well jump into the wagon right now and get started with it. And, uh, you know, you have, it's easy to justify and put the business case to have, uh, you know, one dedicated IT security or two, depending on your size, within your team that can help be the mediator between IT security and clinical engineering. And, we, they won't be able to implement until you actually doing what you have. Because, uh, yes, we can do a security review. We can um, issue all these controls, but these need to be in place and they need to be validated on a known basis. But do you think, uh, that, you know, my IT security team, they're very focused on, you know, the desktop devices and, and uh, wireless devices and things that are coming into the facility. Um, do you think the tools like Zingbox, like a company like Zingbox, what they bring to the table, your IT security team is not looking at for the most part? No, but so we deployed the tool. So my department is kind of different. So I think in order for medical device security to happen, you kind of have to have expansion from both sides, both from the IT security side and the education. But you're, you're a university teaching hospital. Yeah, lots, we're, of, lots, we're of of lots of resources. Yeah. Many of us are not university teaching hospitals, and uh, mm -hmm. their IT departments are challenged when it comes to resources. So I really think this opportunity for us to step up and make the yeah. case, to make the case to invest in a product like Bingbox, or you know, there's lots of products out there 
what they do for us, they gather the IP, the MAC addresses, yeah. all of that data that is a pain in the neck for your technologist to go out there and find. Because I hear it all the time from my team. Oh my God, I gotta go out, I gotta, I gotta go and I gotta get access to the system and see what all that data is behind it. It's a lot of work, it's a heavy lift. When you invest in a product like uh, uh, Zingbox and others, it's all done for you, it's, it's, it's there. And you can, if you do the integration with your CMMS, that's great. It automatically flows into your CMMS once you parse the data. But I think it's a, it's a great investment. So I, you can also like dedicate time. So we've been able like, to do it, but we just had to kind of dedicate time and get executive leadership support to say yep. it's okay to do it on overtime so you can do it on weekends and evenings. So, and, and you made the case for additional FTE. Yeah. Having Zingbox, you can. Yeah, because you can say, like, I have these devices that I need to support. Exactly. And, if, uh, and well, I don't one need of the only thing I didn't mention, are you going to be the first line of. Uh, because if you, clinical team might be, like, lab or pharmacy might be a separate entity. So who's going to be. Because you're going to be monitoring fixes, you're going to be monitoring other uh, devices that you don't have in your inventory. So who's going to be the main? The first contact. So well, I wanted to that's ask, more, you know, explanation for having additional. IP. I wanted to ask May because she, she presented a lot of data up yeah. there with regard to devices that are monitored. Are they devices that Zingbox gathered from the devices their customers are paying for? So a lot of the models of these uh, products that, that such as Zingbox is you pay per connected device. Um, so if they're not paying per connected device. Are, are you still seeing the uh, the other devices that are not paying for? No, right? Actually, because we monitor your network, so every single packet goes through your network, we can see it. So we actually do see all the traffic in all devices. We do see IT devices, we do see medical devices, we do see non-medical IoT devices. But right now, most of hospitals, as uh, Inhal mentioned, they go through steps. For example, first step, okay, I'll pay for all the medical devices. I pay for you to give me visibility. I pay for you to secure my devices, monitor my devices 24 by 7, and then expand to non-medical IoT devices, your printers, your cameras, mass thermostats, and then we start seeing more and more customers start requesting to cover everything, including IT devices. So I think it brings lots of convenience for people who are managing these devices to have a single pay class, to have all the information in one system. And um, thank you for your previous uh, break point, both from Chris and uh, Intel. We do see this new challenge, not just from technology point of view, but also from organizational point of view, in hospitals nowadays, it used to be IT department was in charge of all the connected devices, your cell phone, your laptop, servers. And IMAT team is in, was in charge of the medical devices. And back years ago, not so many medical devices are connected online, and as in pointing out, we're seeing more and more increasing amount of medical devices are connected um, online. So now the challenge is, these connected medical devices, who's really in charge of the security of these connected medical devices? And we see some pioneering hospitals uh, like MedStar and the, so for other hospitals we're seeing, and also that's the recommendation from Gartner is to have an integrated organization, have one person, whether that's your CMO or CIO or CISO, be in charge of all the security issues within the organization. And so, IT department needs to step into medical device field. And as uh, um, both Chris and uh, Intel mentioned, this is actually a great opportunity for a biomed team to step up because only our biomed team are allowed to uh, touch these medical devices, are in charge of these medical devices, know the inside out of these medical devices. But as these devices are connected to the cloud, connected to the network, there are additional security and networking challenges. And that's a great, great opportunity for the biomed team to step up, to step up to 
uh, face these challenges, to address these challenges, to work with IT teams, to work with security teams, to find the solution. We do see now is the time that you need lots of uh, tools because for IT people, they already have tons of tools. They spend lots of money on these tools to give them visibility, to give them security, whether it's firewall, or SIEM, or antivirus, whatever. But for biomed team, they have very limited visibility and support and tools. So this is the time that we can get lots of help, give us the visibility, whether show the visibility to the biomed team, and we can even, um, as Inhal mentioned, and uh, Chris also mentioned, we can show the, because I used to work at Cisco for many years. So from an IT perspective, we only see each and every point as an IP address. And we, now we know for these medical devices, that's not enough. We need to know what this device is, even though both systems are running Windows system. If it is a Windows system controlling an extra machine, it should have different behavior, different security mechanisms compared to a Windows system running our laptop. So we need to know what this device is. And we also need to know, have a real-time monitoring system, know what this device is doing whether this infusion pump is being used in an emergency room, in the operation room, to save the patient's life, then you cannot do active scan at this point. Then you cannot shut down this device at this point. So we need a lot more information provided by biomed team to security team to IT team. So I think this is a great opportunity for everybody in biomed team for your career, for the, for the a future of a secure hospital. Thank you. Any more questions? I'm going to need that guy to ask a question. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I just had a question about your journey and what resources you used to go through the journey and, uh, from, from not having this kind of a function in place to what you need. So the resources started by my position being created with an IT security. And um, so like the CISO wanted to have someone with a clinical engineering background that can bring all that expertise um, in, in, into IT security. And being that person that would be working with these, all these departments like pharmacy, lab, IT, facilities, which is the department that clinical engineering are used to working with. And then uh, we leverage, uh, you know, resource constraint is always there. It's a matter of making sure you prioritize what you have to do. So take a risk-based approach, like I mentioned. And uh, so I started the program in by myself. It's more focusing on security addendums, and it's more focusing on big stuff that can have significant impact on process policies, uh, standards. Um, deploying a project like this, so I had to use project manager um, within our own department, project management to do that because I didn't have the bandwidth to do that myself. And also leveraging the expertise of my peer, which is the director of IT security. So I had the, it's a, it's a team effort within our department. Uh, we could use a, a few more you know, resources for sure, um, but it's leveraging that expertise and uh, being transparent about what I know and what I don't know, I definitely went like a long way. Um, but it's re knowing what you know, what you don't know, and trying to leverage ex expertise with what you already have. And I have a, an analyst with me right now, and I'm going to have another one. And eventually the program will grow, but it's more deciding what you can achieve right now and what can have the most significant impact in your environment. And I do think that you with identifying what you have and deploying a tool like this will help you definitely manage that and then you can build your roadmap and I think like making sure that your devices are being batched that's the minimum and, and if you're doing a preventive maintenance on it you might as well check whether the AD is there, whether the encryption is there, whether the passwords are there. It, it's easy so trying to get the easy targets and Checking which devices you have going in the wide near the internet and restricted, and that can limit. Uh, and then make sure what remote access support. If you do have a PAM solution, then you can deploy that for your medical devices as well. And it's a matter of taking a risk-based approach and then building your roadmap along the way. Yeah. Uh, 
um, one trend we've been seeing across all hospitals we've been working with is this medical security issue is not just an issue for IT. It's not just an issue for IT department. It's not just an issue for security team. But it's becoming an issue that CEO cares about. It's becoming an issue in the boardroom. So we see it across the board that people who are working with us, who are stepping up to take the initiatives to drive this to the next level, not only they become a hero of the hospital, they all start getting increasing amount of resources, whether it's more team members or more budget. Because sadly, but thanks to all the hacking incidents, as uh, the one in health was uh, using as an example, we start seeing increasing amount of hacking incidents getting into hospital, targeted at these medical devices. So everybody from CEO to boardroom to the team members all start really paying attention to medical security issues and are very willing to spend time, resource, budget in this area. So I think this is a great area to take initiative, go back to your own organization, and Zingbox is very willing to be here to help you to go through that journey and uh, make, your, make yourself, make your organization, make your hospital a hero and a leader in this area. I think Thank May, you. you should mention that you're building um, that you're building the uh, the uh, best practices of how yes. to deploy yeah. and um, get the maximum out of this tool. Thank you. Because so that's like what we learned and other organizations learned. Yeah. So not only we see in hospitals this security issue has been escalated up to CEO board members and become a very important issue on top of uh, everybody's mind. But also we start seeing great movement and momentum from policymaker, from whether it's a uh, department um, uh, uh, human and health services, DHH, uh, DH, um, HHS, and Department of Homeland Security, FDA, um, and NIST. We start seeing more and more task forces, and uh, organized effort, a committee, mem a commi more committees to drive more guidelines, best practices, and uh, tighten the rules for medical device security. As in box, actually, we're involved in several standard bodies and committees. For example, um, for the past two and a half years, we are one of the members involved with the HHS effort to come up with a new guideline for um, healthcare, better healthcare cybersecurity practices. And actually, the document just got released the end of last year, and now is in the rollout to all the major hospitals and clinics. And also, uh, DHS also recently started a very large effort on the uh, coordination among policymakers, government organizations, device vendors, and hospitals, and both private sectors and public sectors to work together to address new challenges and security issues. And we're very happy to share more information that we contributed to these standard bodies, committees, and there are great results and great momentum is coming out. Thank you.